Hello and welcome to HSE Online. My name is Paul Clark, founder and CEO of Paul Clark HSE Engagement Services. Today is a very special day as we launch HSE Online, our digital and video content portal, bringing opt-in members valuable, cutting-edge leadership content from senior HSE business leaders all over the world. Every month, HSE Online will be broadcasting four C-level interviews on topics relevant to help and support you in your field from some of the greatest minds that are shaping the future to help us break through the current health and safety plateau. From North America to India, Australia to the Middle East, and South America to Africa, we have the content to help you in your field right at your fingertips. Paul Clark HSE Engagement Services are currently providing market-leading senior leadership events in the European market, North America, Middle East, and right here in the UK where I am now. Where I'm stood in the grounds of the breathtaking Moor Hall, hotel and spa, on what is a beautiful sunny winter morning in the West Midlands, we play host to next month in March to our fourth HSE UK Congress, where we'll be bringing together 50 senior HSE leaders from all over the UK, cross industry, to bring the most cutting edge content in the industry with one of the most star-studded speaker lineups to ever be announced at a physical event to date. What also makes our events unique is they are driven by their own industry advisory councils. And today, I have a real treat for you, as I'm here at Moore Hall to interview the first in a long list of C-level interviews on HSC. Firstly, by interviewing each member of our advisory council one by one. So let's get started. First up, Mr. James Pomeroy, Group Health, Safety, Environmental and Security Director for Lloyd's Register. Myself and James take a deep look into fatality rates and how incident rates have flatlined, not just in the short term, but over nearly six years. We also discuss HSC management systems and the adoption of these processes for millennials and Gen Zs. HSC the perfect storm and finally we take a deep dark look at vigorously promoted safety programs and how effective are they really or are they just bogus. So let's get started. Well, James, uh, James it's, it's, thank you ever so much for coming, and um, you know we're looking forward to, to having you uh, join the HSC Congress UK again this year. Uh, welcome to HSC Online for the first time. Um, got a few questions for you that I'd like to ask. So, um, one of the things that come up uh, through a bit of my research was the figures for serious and fatal injuries in the UK, uh, US, and other developed economies show a worrying trend, while the rate of minor injuries has fallen by about two thirds in the past thirty years. Uh, the number of serious injuries and fatalities has remained consistent in the same period, and this has become more profound in the last seven to eight years, where fatality rate has plateaued. As the profession as a regulator are increasingly dedicating their resources to mental health and well-being, we have to ask, are we doing enough to improve control of serious and fatal injuries? So I guess my question to yourself is, how, how do we as leaders in the HSE recognise this? And secondly, is our current approaches and thinking for serious and fatal injury prevention working, or do we need to try something a bit different? I think it's a really insightful question, and it really kind of speaks to some of the challenges we've got with it as a profession. Mm -hmm. So for, for those that don't know, the, uh, the serious and fatal injury, as you've said, the incident rates both in the UK, the US, and globally, and you will find the same patterns in most developed countries, are not reducing. Right. Now this is really worrying, because serious and fatal injuries are infrequent but very serious for most organisations. We don't even need to mention things like corporate manslaughter and the impact it can have in terms of morale on organisations. Yeah. We've been focusing on, on a particular kind of uh, thesis for about 50, 60 years. Heinrich introduced it and it was this idea that we focus on the minor and we gradually erode all of the causes of the minor incidents mm. and ultimately that will lead to a reduction in the probability in, of serious and, and fatal injuries occurring. Sure. But actually the, the, the studies and all of the research going through now says that's false. That the kind of things that cause minor incidents are very different to what causes fatal incidents. Fatal and serious incidents, I should add. Mm. Um, fatal and serious incidents tend to be more complex. Mm. They tend to involve multi-causal factors. Whereas the things that cause minor incidents generally have no correlation to those that cause the major incidents. Now that's quite profound, sure. because many organisations have been targeting near miss and safety observations. Mm -hmm. We could walk into many oil refineries uh, or any type of organisation, manufacturing, 
and many of them will have targets and they're all based on the premise that you get more and more of this minor data, yeah. you act on it yeah. and eventually you'll reduce the seriousness. But if the, if the theory doesn't hold, mm. then why are we wasting our time on actually targeting, incentivizing people to do things that don't have any real impact? Absolutely. And I think what this speaks to is, is a perfect storm in terms of safety at the moment, yeah. where many of the theories and ideas that we've had are really up for debate. Sure. And really being challenged. So we're in a, a situation where many, many areas of safety are really um, being reviewed and we're having to think differently about how we approach it. And serious and fatal injuries is an example of that. Controversial as well, I suppose. Yeah, it is controversial. Um, it's a difficult area, serious and fatal injuries, for many organisations to face mm. because they are infrequent events. Mm -hmm. um, they are also incidents that you can suddenly be surprised from. Mm. Classically, people will say, well, where did that come from? Mm. Um, but actually, the precursors were dormant and were there in most organisations. Wow. But it also takes us actually into an interesting area of, of what we target and what we measure. Right. So many organisations, their primary metric for safety is their lost time incident rate. Right. Now, if you and I have a similar accident, chances are there'll be a different outcome. Right. I may result in three or four days from that slip or trip, and you may just walk up, dust yourself, and then walk off. <laughs> So if we're going to measure things on based on outcome of yeah. whether they're a lost time incident, it's a really questionable metric. Mm. What's more important is organisations start to understand high potential incidents mm. around serious and fatal injuries. How many times did something happen that resulted in actual serious harm mm. or had the probability to do so? Sure. That's a much more meaningful metric, but me not many organisations are focusing on hypos or mm. even reporting them. Um, so a quick question I wanted to ask, I was doing some reading around uh, the uh, perfect storm in HSC. What are your thoughts? That's really that? insightful. You know, the, the, we've been applying many of the same concepts in safety for about uh, 70 odd years. We really are, independent upon whether your glass is half full or glass is half empty, um, we are in a greatest opportunity or we're in a perfect storm. Right. So let me just explain that a bit more. Mm -hmm. Many of the theories that we've been applying in safety date back to about 1920 or 1930. Mm -hmm. Actually, many of them, as I'll come to explain, mm. um, are really up for debate. Um, many of them are being challenged as being really questionable whether they work. And the most obvious example is Heinrich. But Heinrich has driven behaviours in the safety profession around things like near-miss reporting and focusing on the minor to then reduce the major. Mm. So there's one element of things that are really up for debate. The second element that we refer to in the perfect storm is what's going on in major and, and fatal injuries. Mm. So the number of recordable injuries as measured by riddle or first aid injuries has been falling year on year for the best part of about 30 years. Okay. But actually the number of fatal and serious injuries is completely flatlining. Mm. Globally it's not reducing. So that really presents us a challenge and the challenge is are we doing enough to present the worst, to prevent the worst outcomes? The third element around this perfect storm is a generational shift. Mm. So it's what's going on with the employees who are joining us now. Mm -hmm. And that challenge is around actually the expectations and how we communicate with those employees. Most obviously things like millennials and Gen Zs. Yes. Their expectations in terms of how we communicate, their voice that they want to be heard on, mm -hmm. and actually how we engage with them is going to have to change. Yeah. The fourth element is the most obvious area, it's about health and welfare. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of talk around uh, mental health and, and well-being in the workplace mm -hmm. and we only, I don't need to talk too much about that, most practitioners will be familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And the final element of this perfect storm is the opportunity created by data and digital. Right. So most practitioners have an abundance of, of data. It may be lagging indicators such as uh, uh, injury data, mm -hmm. ill health data, or it could be preventative uh, leading indicators around training data, well-being, uh, employee demographics. Right, right. We have a rich pool of data and the opportunity in the digitalization of safety is to operate more efficiently, mm -hmm. to use more evidence-based interventions and to see how some of that data correlates. Mm -hmm. So we can actually start to measure for once and all actually whether the interventions that we're having really are, are impactful. So this is what we refer to as the perfect storm. And it's really something I'm particularly interested in because when we bring all of that together, the skill sets of practitioners and the challenges that we face as a, as a profession 
are really going to have to change. How about if we look at safety systems and processes, okay? So some will say approach is way too bureaucratic and as a result it's creating more and more paperwork. Some safety critical sectors, so we talked earlier about the aviation sector um, and how they've tackled this issue pretty head on and radically simplified their safety systems. They did this because investigations into a series of aviation accidents demonstrated that safety procedures were a bit too complex, so uh, long and not understood when needed. What, we, what can we learn from the avian, aviation industry and uh, other high-risk sectors? And second to that, how will the next generation, I guess, of employees, the millennials, the Gen Zs, engage with our paper-driven processes? Again, I think what you show in that question is some really insight into some of the challenges that we face. And they're particularly important that we do so because many organisations are transitioning from 18,000 to ISO 45,000. Right, yes. So it's a big change that many organisations are doing with their safety management system. What we need to do is we need to look at the style, the structure of, of our safety management systems um, and think about who they're written for and are we really writing for the audience. Right. Um, it's probably more important to actually write in a simpler a more concise manner so that the, the user can actually understand. Mm. If I give you, for example, a 13-page work in a high procedure, mm. the chances are you're, you're not going to read it. But if, I, if we try and learn some, some elements from psychology, mm. where I give you five things and I say, I want you to remember these five things, get these five things right, yeah, yeah. then it's more likely that you're going to follow them, you're going to comply with them. Yes. So the first thing to say is, is let's, let's keep things simple because we know that we have a higher chance that people will understand it mm. and then we have a higher chance that they will in turn then comply with it. The second element of your question is, is particularly important, so yeah. the generational shift. So um, many, many people will be familiar with uh, the generational shift by mm. having millennials and the, new, the children of the millennials, what we call Gen Zs. Mm -hmm. Now these kind of uh, individuals coming through the, the employment market now they, they expect different, they expect to be more consulted, they, we need, they're not used to actually deep in-depth in elements of mm. paperwork, so we need mm. to actually write things. They're used to learning visually, mm. they've been brought up in, a, in an environment where they're learning visually through YouTube and for other yeah. forms of, of e-learning. And they're not used to that kind of the drudgery of 13, 14, 50 page procedures and no. documentation. So we need to actually write things. And it's brought home to me by, by my kids who often use the, the, the abbreviation TLDR, too long, didn't read. <laughs> Give them any piece of documentation over a page or so. Yeah. And it's not saying anything about my kids, it's just that's the generational shift. Of course. Clickbait and all of that, the idea yeah. of actually, I'm only going to read the first paragraph and then I'm bored. Mm. So we have to kind of embrace that and think, how do we write things and communicate? And, and I say write things, maybe we move away from written procedures to, towards video, and some way, but it, it goes deeper than just how we communicate in terms of how we consult and engage people, because the expectations of Gen Z and Millennial are very different. Well, they expect digital processes, don't they? Because yeah. that was how they were brought up now. Well, yeah. that's how people are brought up now. But. Well, you and I were, were brought up in an environment where the teacher would stand at the front of the class and teach at us. The kids coming through now and in the last 10 years, they've been brought up in an environment to challenge. They've yeah. been taught to challenge. Sure. So if we're going to give them that procedure about, I don't know, forklift safety or driving safety or confined space, don't be surprised if they don't come back and challenge it. No. And they're comfortable doing so and they're right to do so. There's nothing wrong with that. No. You know. Great, thank you. Um, all safety professionals have, we talked to, you mentioned earlier, uh, the heard of the Heinrich applied his ideas, you know, such as the infamous Heinrich Triangle. That, amongst other current safety programs that we come across all the time, you know, behaviour-based safety, zero harm, uh, zero anything, uh, and so forth, which are vigorously promoted uh, by consultancies and adopted by firms and safety professionals. But my question to you, James, is: Are these theories bogus? <laughs> Uh, with all due respect. So organisations need to decide what's appropriate for them. Yep. Now, for some organisations, a behavioural based approach is exactly right for them. Mm. They need a, a higher level of engagement and consensus. 
For others, they may decide they want a more systems-based approach. Right. Um, for some organizations, the, the idea around actually setting a target or an aspiration for zero, whatever you decide is appropriate, right. it is in itself unsuitable. But for others, that is exactly what they need, something visionary. So I think the first thing is, is think independently as an organization. As you say, look at the evidence. Mm -hmm. Where are people being injured or harmed? Where's their, where's their health being affected? And what feedback are they giving you? Sure. Then look and kind attend conferences, attend venues, and go out and look on the market what other people are doing. But I think the final piece in your question is around digitalization, yeah. because this is an area I'm particularly keen to see. So, uh, safety professionals and health um, and welfare specialists as well have a vast array of data within their portfolio. Mm. They have absence data, they have employee demographic data, we have accident data, near miss safety data, mm. we, let alone the environment data. Put that alongside the training data mm. and then you have a vast arsenal of, of data. Yes. But we're using very little of it. Right, yeah. So the opportunity in the concept of big data mm. and, and the idea about digitalization, it really is actually looking, what can we learn from the data? What is the mm. data telling us? And actually, do we need to introduce some new specialisms within safety? 100%. For example, where we start to say, let's have a, uh, a data analyst within yeah. the safety team. Yeah. Someone who really understands how to mine data and can correlate that data. Mm -hmm. Because we, we have a treasure trove of information at our fingertips, mm -hmm. but we're not using it enough. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean uh, funny enough, I had a conversation with another interviewee around data adoption. And the biggest challenge is, you know, HSC professionals are not, even the, the greatest um, data anal analysts struggle to turn data into actionable insight. And um, you have to think that the armory of the HSC professional has never been built around understanding copious amounts of data. No. And so where can we support, and you know, you have to think perhaps building into a, a digital EHS uh, IT roadmap pipe perhaps might be able to support uh, especially with all the technologies being implemented, wearables, yeah. uh, you know, VR, uh, drones yeah. now as well. It's all quite an armory, but it's just being able to take that and turn it into insight that's going to help you capture and make sense and hopefully you know, be able to reduce the number of incidents. Yeah, I think that there are, um, there are real opportunities in the world of digitalization. So you mentioned things like wearables. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's the whole issue of GDPR and whose data that is, and, and we've learned from the news stories that we need to be very careful about that and make sure, sure it's compliant and consulted. Yeah. On the data side, equally, I think the, the insights and the learnings of that are probably not going to come from safety. Mm. So the sectors that have done particularly well at this are customer research, particularly in retail. Mm. If we roll back 20 or 30 years, the big retailers got very early on in, in big data and started to understand through loyalty programs. Now, you may think that's completely left field, why am I talking about that? Because that's mm. where the specialism, it then moved into finance and banking and insurance. And so we now need to look and say, well, we have this big, what we term data lake, mm -hmm. where we have various kind of segments of data in there. Right. How can we actually bring some insight into that? And it probably won't happen through safety professionals. It's going to happen through us partnering with some digital and data organizations mm -hmm. to bring them in to actually say, well, Here's what we have in terms of data. Interesting. How is the relationship between uh, an EHS uh, professional and an IT specialist within an organisation? Does, does that work quite well? Are you able to knock on the door to get support? Or? At, at Lloyd's, yeah, we, we have yeah. a lot. We have a dedicated set of data team. I don't think it's necessary. You have to have the insight to be able to see that, sure. see the opportunity. So we got very early on in this and we looked. Um, probably about two years ago and hired in a series of data analysts to look at our safety data. Mm. But the first thing is you have to be curious and you have sure. to be inquisitive to say, we think there's opportunity there. Of course. Um, and you have to also see the potential in the range of data that you have within an organization. Mm. The average rig, chemical plant or large manufacturing organization will probably have up to about 30 to 40 separate pieces of data. Wow. They'll be siloed. They won't be looking to see whether there are links or correlations between mm. them let alone thinking about the opportunity. So it's really actually seeing the opportunity and then being prepared to invest because it does take time. Right. James, thank you ever so much for coming in. Appreciate your thank time you. and uh, yeah, thank you very much and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.